Okay, as I said, it's power from the EMS uh, chairman of the Pestalozzi Trust. Uh, this is a presentation about the Bella Bill and how to prepare for the public hearings. Um, for those that don't know it by now, the Bella Bill stands for the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill. So it is a proposal to amend a law, in this specific case, a proposal to amend the South African Schools Act. Um, although there have been various Bella Bills before, uh, this is the first major update to the SA Schools Act since 1996. And this is why this is a very important bill. Okay, so the bill is going to change the law, but there is a process through which it goes um, before it becomes law. So, so what is in the Bella Bill now is not law yet, and you don't have to act uh, according to it. You still, the, the South African Schools Act is still the law to which we must comply. So it's a proposal uh, to change the law that can currently not be enforced. Um, there's been a, it's followed a process. Firstly, uh, the minister has decided that she wants to change the law and she um, appointed a task team that started drafting this law and they've already started in 2013 uh, to do this. This whole process that I went through, I'm calling that the pre-parliamentary process. Now, after it's gone through that process and it's ready for parliament, it is tabled at parliament, and then it goes through a parliamentary process. And we'll zoom uh, into that process in a later slide. And after parliament has approved the bill, it, it is given to the president for signature. As soon as the president signs it, the bill will now become a law and will be uh, will be uh, will be started to be enforced. Um, after Bella Bill becomes law, we can expect that that regulations will be made. Regulations. Describe in finer detail how the law will be enforced. Um, and then yet, uh, sufficient budget must be uh, made available so that it's possible to enforce this law. And obviously the major challenge for Bellable is there must be sufficient budget to uh, accommodate all the great R's because one of the changes in Bellable is that great R becomes compulsory. And as soon as the president has signed the law, we can also expect that legal challenges will start. Um, so for a legal challenge to be successful, it is important that all avenues have been exhausted to address the problems in Bella Bill. So we cannot just do nothing. And as soon as um, the bill becomes enforced, we, we go to the court. We must exhaust all avenues, and that is these public hearings that we attend now and all the letters we write, that's all part of exhausting all possible avenues. And the Pestalozzi, that's why Pestalozzi Trust has been involved in this whole process since 2017. And, and we're using all opportunity to, to address our concerns. And that all will be yet presented to the court as evidence that we've done this. We also expect that there will be a number of legal challenges after the bill has been signed by the president. The Pestalozzi Trust will mainly focus on challenging Clause 1 and Clause 35, and other parties will challenge other clauses. And where it makes sense, the Pestalozzi Trust will um, join other challenges in order to increase the probability that the entire bill is set aside. Now we're going to the next slide. This, this slide explains the process that it goes through 
in um, in Parliament. So Parliament consists of two houses, namely the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. Uh, the National Assembly consists of about 400 members who are elected every five years, and and they are are appointed based on the number of votes they got in, you know, or their party got uh, in the election. The National Council of Provinces re represents the government of the provinces and they are, are they the provinces have got equal presentation. So it's a different composition than the National Assembly. Um, the ballot bill must go through both houses. So you'll see in a previous slide, there was something mentioned or at, um, it says at the top, section 76. It's a 70, section 76 bill that must go through both houses. Now, the ballot bill has already be, gone through the National Assembly, and the National Assembly has adopted this bill, and it's now currently at the National Council of Provinces. It's important to take note of this, because sometimes people get confused, because they think that since the National Assembly has adopted it, it's now been approved, but that is not the case. It's still it's in the currently in the National Council of Provinces. So if the National Council of Provinces um, adopt this bill, <coughs> sorry, then uh, it will go to the president. But if the National Council of Provinces uh, maybe differs from the National Assembly, the bill will have to go through some kind of dispute resolution mechanism. So it is important if, if we can convince the National Council of Provinces to, to, um, to want to make changes um, that do not agree with what the National Assembly has adopted, it will take an enormous amount of time and then the bill will not be um, adopted uh, before um, Parliament is dissolved. So that is why these hearings are so important. Now let's proceed. Um, this is the process it follows when it goes through the National Council of Provinces. It's for those that have been involved in the hearings of the National Assembly. It's very similar. Um, there will be uh, there will be uh, public participation consisting of written submissions, oral submissions, and public hearings. So currently, uh, the, the, the written submissions, that date has already been passed. The closing date for that was 19th of January. Um, the public hearings are currently in progress in the different provinces. And then the oral submissions, those are uh, parties that requested to make oral submissions to substantiate their written submissions. Those are then invited to do oral submissions to the National um, Council of Provinces uh, in Parliament in Cape Town, similar to the oral submissions that were done for the National Assembly. Um, okay, and then the public hearings have already explained. After that, it will be, de be debated in the House um that debate is expected to be March April and if they then adopt the bill the bill is passed now I've added this line to uh, this diagram showing that at some stage Parliament will dissolve what the date of that is we don't know it the the president must announce that he he will announce a date when Parliament will dissolve and when the election will be. So hopefully, um, we had all, the ballot will not make it and, and Parliament will be dissolved. So this, the, this bill is under enormous um, time pressure. Okay. Um, Home educators have got what we call procedural and substantive objections to the ballot bill. Procedural objections refer to objections against the process used to draft the ballot bill. 
while substantive objections refer to objections against the content of the Bella Bill. So this uh, gives a, an overview of the procedural objective that, that the Pestalozzi Trust has uh, put in, in their um, uh, submission. So the first one is stakeholders were unable to consider the impact of Bella Bill. Now, for every legislative change, it is necessary that a socioeconomic impact assessment must be done. And that document ex explains to the general public what the impact of the bill will be. And that is something that the public must get, uh, also consider. So you should get, when they public, uh, uh, publicize the bill for comment, they must then also include the social in, in, in economic impact assessment. Unfortunately, that was not done, not in 2017 and also not in 2022. So the public did not have the opportunity to consider the impact of the bill. Um, we did, however, uh, the Pistolozzi Trust, by means of a prior request, did get a copy of the um, socioeconomic impact assessment, and we have analyzed that. And we have found that it has not really meaningfully um, assessed the impact of Bellable on home education. So just some things that ha ha have not been assessed. The one is the Bellable has got an impact on the state, yet the state must have certain resources to, to offer a registration service at an acceptable uh, lo level. Secondly, they haven't considered what is the impact on the home education sector if education programs are prescribed. Furthermore, Bellable limits the venues where you can, can provide uh, uh, home education. Uh, yet I will explain these things a bit later in the substantive arguments. The, the impact of that has not been uh, considered. Also, Bellable uh, limits the type of educational support you must use. That has not been considered. And also the impact of assessment, especially the financial impact of assessment, that hasn't been considered by the SIA. So that is another problem. So the, the SIA, the, um, the, the fact that the SIA wasn't done seems to be, in or the SIA uh, is not based on research, and, and that does not seem to be uh, an oversight. That's not they forgiving because we've uh, repeatedly said, listen here, these are the things you must look at when you do a SIA. And here is some research. This is the research needed to do that. And, and it's, it, they've been, they knew that from the start. It was highlighted to them by Dr. Trevor Coombe, um, and a consultant to the Department of Education, but despite all of this, they didn't consider um, a research-based impact assessment. The third problem is Bella Bull has got a section 50, the proposed section 5116 gives the, the minister broad powers to, um, to regulate home education. And we must now evaluate what the impact of this will be without knowing what broad powers is the minister going to use. So that makes it very difficult to, to um, give meaningful input on, is it a good thing to give the minister so many broad powers? And then the fourth problem with the procedural problem is that there are currently regulations in force in case it in the Northwest. Those regulations have been um, issued in terms of the Provincial Schools Act in those provinces, and they will remain in force uh, if Bellable becomes law, 
because they are in terms of the provincial act and not the national act. Uh, so that, that that hasn't been considered, and it's an important thing in the regulations that they must consider that. So these are our procedural uh, objections to the Bella Bill. Then we get to the substantive objections that we've got against Bella Bill. Firstly, the Clause 35 allows the head of department or HOD to set aside the decisions of parents. Now, parents have got the right to choose home education, but Clause 35 gives the HOD powers to set aside the decisions of parents while not being sufficiently equipped to, to determine the kind of education that's in the best interest of a specific child. If the HOD doesn't know the child, doesn't know all the considerations that parents uh, take into account when choosing home education. Secondly, Clause 35 outlaws education programs not comparable to the national curriculum. Clause 35 of the Bill of limits the right to education by adding an additional requirement not in the list uh, given in the Constitution by requiring that the proposed home education program predominantly covers the acquisitions as of skills and content at least comparable to the re relevant national curriculum determined by the minister. This essentially outlaws education programs of a standard that is the same or higher than the national curriculum, but covers skills and contents that are not comparable to the national curriculum. Furthermore, clause one, that is the defin definition clause, restricts the places that can be used for home education. The definition of home education in clause one limits the right to education, requiring that it must happen, and I quote, in the environment of the learner's home. This essentially outlaws the provision of an education program under the direction of the learner's parent in an appropriate environment outside the learner's home. For example, this will prohib prohibit the situation where somebody is able to provide education at the workplace. For example, a hair salon. Uh, it, it also prohibits collaborative home education where families work together to, on the education of their children and, and the education takes pl place at multiple locations. Such a restriction will not be in the best interest of children. And then thirdly, Clause 1 restricts the use of tutorial or education support. The definition of home education in Clause 1 limits the right to education, requiring that it, quote, may include tutorial or other education support if necessary, secured by the parents on specific areas of the curriculum followed by the learner. This essentially outlaws the use of appropriate tutorial or other, or other education support on all areas of the curriculum provided under the direction of the learner's parent. For example, this will prohibit the situation when parents use a family member that might even be a qualified teacher to provide all education at the child's home. Okay. Now we're going to the um, proposal of the Pestalozzi Trust. So we, uh, if we look in the CIAS, or the Socioeconomic Impact Assessment, we know that the DBE expects disputes between home education and pro provincial, edu uh, provincial education department because um, it says so in the CIAS. And it proposes to resolve this by means of mediation and litigation. While such these disputes are in progress, it will cause delays in the implementation of the bill and expenses will be incurred. The Pestalozzi Trust therefore proposes an alternative formulation of Clause 35 that will protect the rights and freedoms of home education families and also uphold the rule of law. The Trust therefore advises that 
Parliament considers a fundamental review of the education system to make better provision not only for home education, but also for many emerging educational forms. Such since 1996, the education landscape has changed from a unipolar landscape dominated by schools to a multiple multipolar landscape consisting of a diversity, diversity of educational forms of which home education is only one. Other forms include online schools, tutor centers, cottage schools, collaborative home education, co-working spaces, etc. This was not only proposed by the Pestalozzi, it was by many, but also by many other stakeholders made similar requests. In the past, the Pestalozzi Trust has never challenged registration, but only unlawful registration conditions. Now, the, the proposal of the Pestalozzi Trust is now focusing to take the power of the HOD a way to decline registration on its own. If this proposal is ad adopted, it will be a game changer. Furthermore, in a court case, applicants must clearly state the relief they seek. Now, this proposal clearly describes the relief that we seek uh, for home educators. And it was um, reviewed by the legal team to have a reasonable chance of success. If this proposal is submitted to Parliament and rejected without valid reason, it will create great grounds to claim that Parliament has not considered a reasonable proposal. So as you can see, this is all building up to a court case in the future. This is the contents of um, the proposal that, that the Pestalozzi Trust made. It's based on the principle that the head of the department is not allowed to decline a request to register for a child uh, for, to get home education. Only if the HOD has reasons to believe that home education is not in the best interest of the children, the HOD can investigate the case and submit the necessary evidence to the court and ask the court to set aside the decision of parents as upper guardian of the child. So I'm not going to read through this thing. Um, it has been distributed uh, on our mailing lists and on WhatsApp, so you can read it yourself. But um, that is in, in, uh, in essence what it does. The benefits of this proposal is that it objectively realizes the purpose of the Bella Bowl because it removes uncertainty, it clarifies matters, as it is stated in Bella Bowl itself. But secondly, it does not allow education officials to, to set aside um, decisions of parents. Those, uh, those powers are only um, given to the courts and not to education of officials. Thirdly, if there is an exceptional case um, where there is reason to believe that home education is used as something as a smoke screen for neglect, then this proposal gives a clear roadmap how um, education officials can um, address the matter. And it also addresses the limitations on the right to education, which I've uh, explained in the substantive um, um, objections. So it meets the constitutional criteria that it doesn't infringe on the right to education. And lastly, it acknowledges that although the vast majority of home educators provide a good education to their children, there are exceptional cases where home education is used as a smoke screen for child neglect. And this solution now gives a, it describes the measures that can be take to, taken to address those um, situations. So that is the objections to the Bella Bowl, the proposal given by the Pestalozzi Trust. And now we're going to give an overview of um, how you can structure your proposal to, um, to the, uh, in the public hearings. 
Um, so this is just an overview of the type of elements that should be there. Give a brief in, in, a, in a written or a, uh, oral um, submission, give a brief introduction to your and your family as and how long you've been homeschooling and your reason for cho choosing home education. It is, however, important to keep this very short, one or two sentences. But the purpose is this, to establish you yourself as authentic and authoritative on your, your subject. But this is not what your yet um, this is not what your um, submission is about. Then you can mention that the Bella Bowl was rejected by the majority of people that submitted written submissions and attended public hearings. You can then thirdly explain the procedural objections you have with the Bella Bowl, as described above, that the SIA was not published, did not consider the impact on home education that it gives unlimited powers to the minister and, and also doesn't consider um, provincial uh, regulations. Then you can explain substantive objections and you can choose those objections that you feel strong about. Um, should education officials be allowed to set aside your decisions? What is your opinion on that? Should your curriculum choice be limited? Um, why can you not yet make use uh, tutors for all of the curriculum. Why is that restricted? And for some people that is important, for others it's not important. And, uh, and, and do you think assessment does serve any purpose? You choose whatever you think is, is, is important to you. And then you can propose a solution. The uh, Pestalozzi Trust proposal is one of those solutions, but there have been uh, provincial associations that also defined solutions. And then you can propose that the Bella Bowl must back, go back to the drawing board to accommodate yet a diversity of educational forms. So some people that are involved in centers or tutor centers, they can, they can address that, that thing. And then you thank the committee for listening to your submission. And there we are, um, written submissions to the NCOP is closed already. Um, uh, provincial hearings are currently in progress. There's a regular, um, on a regular basis, the dates are made uh, available. And then the oral submissions to the NCOP. Okay, I didn't update my slides. That will be the 6th and the 8th of March. And then just quickly, the, all the um, hearings, these hearings have finished already. Um, we are now here. There's hearings in Free State and Northern Cape and Gauteng this week. Um, going further, Western Cape will start the 26th of February and then there will also be Gauteng Free State. Um, and then from four to eight months, there is a enormous a number of, of hearings. Um, I've got no idea how that will work, uh, but there's lots of hearings. So here you see two pages of hearings. So this is Nelson Mandela, Sarah Bartman, and Joe Kwabi. Um, and here's another list of hearings in the same period, Chris Hani of at Alfred and Zo and Amatole in Buffalo City. So, and then things, uh, the grand finale will be in the Western Cape of in Paul, Saldana and Cape Town. So the last hearing will be in the CBD uh, of Cape Town in the building of the provincial legislator. And that is where I 